Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, we want to thank you all for tuning in today. If you're just now tuning in to the 11th hour, just a quick recap. Uh, like I said, obviously, I am not Robin D. Bullock, but he and my mom are in Israel right now. And uh, we, we were trying to get some video sent over, but where they are at, there is just hardly any way that we could possibly get uh, it uploaded, edited, and all that because it's so slow and the time difference and things like that. But next week, I know that we will have a lot of special things planned for all of our 11th hour family, and I myself am excited and can't wait to see it. And it was so good to see my mom and dad up on, up on the screen today, uh, me and, and my brother and uh, my sister in love said they've only been gone for what it's like two weeks but that two weeks feels like six months so it's good to see them on uh, on the screen today but obviously the praise and worship was pre-recorded but it does not make it any less powerful than what it was I remember that day very well and the Lord moved in the fortress that day and sounds came out and the Lord started speaking and so we're going to get into some uh, prophetic connections here in just a moment and I want to read to you real quick out of the book of Matthew <clears throat> Matthew 11 uh, chapter 11 verse 7 and it says, and as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, concerning John the Baptist, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see a man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what Went ye out for to see a prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. Now, I want to read this out of the Passion Translation right here. It says, Jesus answered them and said, it said, as they were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What kind of man did you see when you went out into the wilderness? Did you expect to see a man who would be easily intimidated? Who was he? Did you expect to see a man decked out in the splendid fashion of the day? Those who wear fancy clothes live like kings in palaces? Or did you encounter a true prophet out in the lonely wilderness? Yes, John was a prophet like those of the past, but he is even more than that. He was the fulfillment of this scripture where it says, See, I'm sending my prophetic messenger who will go ahead of me and prepare hearts to receive me. Now, people wonder, they say, how, how do we have our prophets still relevant? Do they still exist the way that they did back in the Old Testament? Well, this is in the New Testament. And Jesus is speaking of a prophet. He is speaking of what he calls the greatest, John the Baptist. But that was in the New Testament. And Jesus spoke about them. So we know that prophets do still exist. Do we need them? Yes. We need the prophets. Because it says right here, it says, I'm sending my prophetic messenger who will go ahead of me and prepare hearts to receive me. See, people say, well, why do we actually need them? Why, what is the reasoning that we need prophets? Well, see, there is the hand of God, the fivefold ministry. We have apostles, we have prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. You know, my, my dad describes it as this, the teacher is the pinky cleans out the ear. The pastor is the ring finger married to the church. The evangelist is the middle finger, the one that reaches out further than all of them. The prophet is the one 
that points the way and says, thus saith the Lord. And the apostle is the only one who can touch all the other four. But for the longest time, the church only wanted a three-fingered hand of God. And so they chopped off two of the fingers. They chopped off the apostle and the prophet. You see, I can pick up my phone right here with three fingers. I can pick it up. But if you were to come and rip it out of my hand, well, you can have it. Because there's no way I'm holding on to this phone with three fingers. I mean, that's, that's it right there. And I'm really struggling to hold on to it. But if I have all my fingers, well, then more power to you if you can rip it out of my hand. Because I'll put up a fight for you to try to get it out. Because why? I can hold on to it with my entire hand. See, you see this blade right here? This is what we are supposed to be fighting with. This blade represents the Word of God. This is just a physical representation of the Word. Why? Because it says that the Word is sharper than any two-edged sword. And so, if we are to hold a blade with three fingers... You can't swing this blade with three fingers. You'd hurt yourself before you'd hurt somebody else. There's, there's no way. You, you, can't, you can't hold it with three fingers. But if I've got my whole hand on this, well, then I've, I've got a hold of it. And you're not going to rip this out of my hand. But even more than that, if I have two hands, the sword of the Spirit, and I've got two hands on that, well, then I can, I can withstand the enemy, and I can win. Why? Because I've got, I've got all of it. I've got all of it. When, when God has his whole hand at work, we make a difference. We make an impact. We are a force to be reckoned with in the spirit. And we are dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. But we, are, we make an impact for the kingdom of God. And that's how we change this world. And that's how, that's how we, we go out and we start occupying space is with the whole hand of God. But when prophets actually come on the scene, well, then the church and, and different people, they don't want prophets. They don't like prophets. Why? Because they don't look like that, what they think they should look like. If you were to see John the Baptist today, I, I don't know why everybody gets on to prophets for the way that they look right now, but don't have anything bad to say about John the Baptist. They said John the Baptist was wild. That he was wild. What about Elijah? No, you don't hear people calling, calling Elijah a false prophet. You don't hear people talking bad about Elijah. So why do we talk bad about prophets now? Just because they look different? Well, what'd you come to see? A reed shaking in the wind? What'd you come to see? A man in sheik's clothing? That's what one translation says. A man in silk clothing like a sheik would wear. But no, we need the prophets because just like the Passion Translation says, what did you come to see? A man who was easily intimidated? Prophets are not intimidated. 
they're the ones who are bold enough to point their finger in the face of a king and say, thus saith the Lord. Nathan walked into David, told him the story, and put it parallel to what he had just done to Uriah. David said, now this was the king. And David said, who is this man? Who is this man? Basically, I'll kill him right now. How dare he do something like this? Do you know what kind of boldness it took to point his finger and say, thou art that man? To a king told him, you did it. This story is about you. Pronounced his, his judgment in the court of heaven. Because that's what prophets do. They bring the court of heaven to the earth. And they try kings. They try leaders. You say, oh, I'd be bold enough to walk up in there and tell a king. The first armed guard that stomped their, feet, their foot at you, you'd be like, you know what? I was just kidding. I was just kidding. I, I, I'm going to come back another day. I got something else to do. I'm late. You know, I, I'm on, I'll, I'll catch y'all later. But to just walk in there and give the word of the Lord to authority, to leaders, that can only be done when somebody steps in to the office of a prophet and puts on that mantle. I'm not a prophet. Are we all prophetic? Yes. Especially all of our partners. You're all prophetic. Why? Because you partnered up with a prophetic ministry. But we're not all prophets. But we are the prophet of our own life. But we all don't walk in that office. Understand? There's a difference between operating in the gift of prophecy and then operating in the gift of a prophet, in the office of a prophet. A lot of people get those confused. So therefore they think that prophets don't exist anymore. But God is a God that never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he used prophets back then, well, then he uses them today. And my brother and sister, you don't want to know what these last few years would have looked like without them. You don't want to know. I thank God we didn't have to go these last few years without them. That there were men and women who were bold enough to come on the scene. No matter the, the backlash, no matter the criticism, no matter what they had to deal with. That they were bold enough to come on the scene and say, thus saith the Lord. And speak to an entire nation and the nations of this world and the leaders of them. They were bold enough to do such a thing. Thank God for them. Has these last few years been, been difficult? Absolutely. But we've had the prophets to tell us what's coming, to declare the end from the beginning. That's what prophets do. They see into the future and they declare the end from the beginning. And they tell us, this is what the Lord is saying. This is where we're going. And they give us instruction without them. I feel like we would have just been walking around blindly. Would God have spoken to each of us? Yes. But would each of us have listened? That I can't tell you. That's up to you. I would like to think that we would, but how many times have God tried to tell us to do something and we didn't listen? 
and we got ourselves into the valley of the shadow of death. But God sent his prophets and put them back on the scene to declare the word of the Lord in one of the most difficult times we've ever faced in our life. So yeah, they don't look like your average people. I thank God for that. Why? They come on the scene. They catch people's attention. They catch people's attention. And guess what? Those people listen. You know, normal, what I like to say, normal people, average people, well, they might say, well, they're weird. What they're saying couldn't possibly be true. But these leaders in high authority, they listen. And they know. Why? Because when they're raised up in that, and they're raised up in their position of authority, well, then they know who speaks to them. And it's prophets. Why do you think David let Nathan in to speak to him? He knew who carried the word of the Lord for a king. So whether you believe it or not, they do. And those of us that don't operate in that office or that mantle, we need to thank God and pray and lift up the ones that do. Because they're fighting for you and I. And they're speaking things and mysteries that are hidden in God. They're constantly listening for the word of the Lord to bring hope to the people. And so today, I wanted to come to you and I wanted to tell you exactly why we need the prophets from somebody who doesn't walk in in that office. From somebody who observes those that do. And that, I feel like Jesus. Well, what did you come to see? A man who was intimidated? We need our we need our men and women in this office of a prophet who is not intimidated. And it is our job, your job, my job, to hold these men and women up. To hold their arms up. To pray for them. To pray strength for them. You do realize that they don't rest most of the time. They, they barely sleep. Why? Because they're constantly listening for a word from God, for the people, to bring deliverance to people. So pray for them. Pray for them. I have the privilege and the honor of watching someone almost on a daily basis who operates in that office. Pray for them. Trust me. Pray for them. Lift them up. Hold them up. You don't want to know a world without them. Especially not during this time. So as we go into this segment of prophetic connections, it's just something to show you why we need prophets. Why we need these, these men and women of God. Why we still need that finger to point the way. So as you watch today, 
understand, and some of you may have seen these before, and that's okay, but it never hurts to refresh yourself, to hear it again, to watch it again. Never hurts. You may just catch something you never caught before. So get your catchers out and understand why we need these people. So I encourage all of our 11th hour family, all of our partners, everybody watching today, pray for the prophets because they pray for you. We'll be right back after this. Wow. Um, I don't know about you, but just the fact that we can, that God has people that can see that far into the future and tell us, listen, this is, this is what you need to get ready for. This is what you need to prepare for. This is the way you stop something. This is what's coming. Now you see why we need prophets. And as, as we were showing the one about the train, Sunday morning at Church International, I, I spoke about a train. We've been, we've been speaking on this God train, this love train that's going. You know, God is love. So we know that the love train is the Jesus train. And I, I begin to become curious about the definition of a train. And if you know me, if you've listened to, to me speak before, you know that I do actually enjoy the definition of words. I like to, to figure out all the different meanings. And there's a couple different ones that uh, spoke, that really spoke to me and, and just kind of jumped out and was just put right before my eyes, the Lord was like, hey, this is what you need to pay attention to. So one of them, it said, a retinue of attendants accompanying an important person. Well, I don't know if there's any more important person than Jesus. Newsflash, there's not. <laughs> There's not a more important person. And another one is a sequence of events or actions leading to some result or goal. And this was what I found really interesting. Right up underneath it, it used an example, and it said, a revolution had been set in train. Well, what have we been talking about? The Jesus revolution. The Jesus revolution. See, we are, we are to come together to accompany an important person. We are to come together to accomplish one goal. What is the goal? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Tell everyone about Jesus. Tell every single person we possibly can about Jesus. Tell them about the manger. Tell them about how he was born of a virgin. One of the most spectacular events to ever take place on this earth. Then tell them about the night that the angels broke through and they said glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Guess who foretold Jesus is coming? Prophets. We are to tell them that he's not a baby in a manger anymore. And then we are to tell them about his life, about the miracles, about how if every miracle and everything that Jesus did was to have been recorded, the books could not hold it. Or to tell people about his ministry while he was here on the earth because he was here. It's a true story. 
really did happen. My parents are getting to walk in places right now that he walked. He actually walked. But then we are to tell them about the crucifixion. We are to tell them about how he became our sin. He didn't carry our sin. Anything that you can carry can be thrown off. He became our sin. Everything we could ever do, he became it. There's one translation that says he absorbed the curse into his being. He became a curse for us so that we didn't have to live under the curse. But then we tell them how he got off that cross and how he went to hell. The worst possible place you could ever go in this life and the life to come. The worst place you could ever go somewhere that was never created for you and I. But he went there because somebody had to go. And he went there. And then we are to tell them after three days and nights that the Holy Ghost roared in to the pits of the damned and stretched himself up on Jesus and breathed life back into him. And he rose from the dead victorious, the King of kings and Lord of lords, with the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And then we are to go past that. We're to tell them of the ascension. We're to tell them about the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, in the upper room. But then, just like that song that we sing at church sometimes, he's not a baby in a manger anymore. He's not that broken man on the cross. He didn't stay in the grave. And my favorite line, he's not staying in heaven forever. Why? Because he's coming back. And he's going to come back. This time, not a baby. This time, not a broken man on the cross. This time, he is coming back, King of kings and Lord of lords. And he's coming back for you and I. And he will reign forever. And this is what we are all to come in to one accord on this train. We're all to get together and come together on this train to accompany one important person. And that person's name is Jesus. And to do that, we've got to get together in unity, to come together, quit fighting, quit bickering, just because you don't understand something that somebody else got a revelation of. And we're having to make unnecessary stops on this journey to let people off because they decided to get offended and get upset. When we should keep going because we should all be under the banner of one important person. And we should all be striving for one goal. And this train's moving. We need to decide if we're going to get on and stay. If you're going to get on and then get off or if you're going to even get on at all. But it's time to make up your mind and make a consecrated decision of which train you're riding on and which train you've got a ticket for. You know, there used to be, I've heard the saying, I've got a ticket on a train bound for glory. Well, God made a promise to Moses and he said, my glory will fill this earth. It's mine and your job to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. 
because guess what? He's not staying in heaven forever. And so today, if you don't know that man named Jesus, then I want to give you an opportunity right now to get your ticket. It's free. It's free. He already paid the price. He already paid the price for your ticket. He already covered all your expenses. Just get on the train. But the way you do that is to accept him as Lord and Savior. Because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father but through me. And the scripture makes it the easiest thing in the world to do. All you have to do is just say, Jesus, I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. And just to add something to it, say, take my life and do something with it. And my brother and sister, because now that's what you are. You are on that train. And I'm telling you, it's about to take us places that we never in our wildest dreams thought we would ever go. Oh, but he's the exceeding abundant above all that we could ask or think, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to be on this train, on the Jesus train. But we got to get together, people all over the world. Join hands. Start a love train. Oh, I love that song. And if I could if I could jump to all the instruments right now, I'd be playing it. People all over the world be doing the dance. Join hands. I know you're doing it. You're doing it with me. I don't I don't know about you, but it's exciting times. Because why? Our best days are ahead of us. They're not behind us. But we got a job to do. Because he's not staying in heaven forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, it's offering time here on the 11th hour. So if you would like to give today, simply just go to robindbullock.com. You know, there's times where I have to think in my, my head, which one is, what is today? Is this today Sunday or is today Tuesday? But it is robindbullock.com. The ways to give are on the screen. And you can also go to the website, find all the information there as well. You know, on this train, it to go ye into all the world, you know, my friends, we could try to do it on foot. And we could try to just throw a backpack on. And, you know, go on foot, travel. You won't get very far. And eventually, your shoes will wear out. And then it's going to take money to buy more shoes. And, uh, you know, people just think that people just think that money is just such a bad thing and that Christians shouldn't have it. And that's not true at all. The scripture says that Jesus became poor so that you could become rich. That actually means on the cross, during the great exchange, he exchanged his prosperity to take your poverty. One translation says in one stroke, he became poor so that you could become rich. The scripture doesn't say it's money that's evil. It says it's the love of money. The love of money is the root of all evil. What's wrong is when money owns you. And every decision you make is dictated by that one piece of paper. But if you own the money, well, then you tell it what to do. And you say, we're going to preach the gospel. And it'll say, yes, ma'am, or yes, sir. So now you can see why the enemy wants to keep it out of your hands. So don't let, don't let the enemy deceive you any longer about that. 
It ain't, it ain't having money that's so wrong. It's when you love it. So, get out of the fear of not having enough. Don't become obsessed with it. And you won't love it. But use it to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Because like I said, we got to occupy space. Every available platform we possibly can get on, we got to do it. And that goes for you too. Anybody who has their ministry as well, you got to do that too. You got to occupy. We are to occupy until he comes. And that means spiritually, physically, and financially. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, Luke 6, 38, I speak over you. It says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You say, I believe it. I receive it. I call it done in Jesus' name. Now, if you're a tither, you know, the scripture says that he will rebuke the devourer for your sake. It's also the only time in the scripture where Jesus says, put me to the test. Prove me. Put me to the test. See if I won't do this for you. You can't outgive God. You just can't. So Malachi 3:10 says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts, and all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. You say, I believe it, I receive it, I call it done in Jesus' name. Amen. So be it. Praise God. Well, thank you so much for tuning in today. You know, this is the first 11th hour that I have ever done by myself. And so I've got a lot, i got some big shoes to fill. But thank you to my 11th hour family for standing strong with me, for agreeing with me, for uh, putting your faith in agreement with mine that we can get what God uh, wanted said. We can say what God wanted said and get done what he wanted done. You know, I, I could do it without you. But I sure don't want to. I love each and every one of you. And I cannot wait to see your faces on the other side of that camera. A couple places that we will be coming in the month of May. We will be going to Philadelphia, Mississippi. And that is on uh, the, I believe it is the amphitheater uh, that the Choctaw Indians uh, that that tribe owns and so um, I'm so excited and I'm going to make sure that I get this right it was posted on social media yesterday but I'm just going to make sure Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians Amphitheater that is May 20th uh, that's a Saturday and the first service will be at 10 and I believe 10 a.m. and the second service will be at 2 p.m. So come visit us. It's in Philadelphia, Mississippi. And for more information on that, you can go to globalvisionfc.com. Also, uh, at the end of May, on Friday night, May 26th, uh, May 26th at 7 p.m. We will be, it's called the Tent of Miracles, and that's that's in Brunswick, Georgia. And that is uh, with Miles Kilby Ministries, and we are so excited. So if, if you're in that area, come see us, and we'll be announcing uh, other places that we will be coming also. F so for more information on that, go to mileskilby.com. We look forward to seeing you uh, this month and this summer, this fall. And then you know what? Come see us at Church International in Warrior, Alabama, the little town that's shaking the nation. Until next time we gather together right here around God's word, I want you to remember and never forget that we love you, Jesus loves you, say it with me, that God is absolutely good. Shalom, shalom.